So this definitely shows that um, even in the absence of language in other species or in, um, in the young human beings who are pre-linguistic, um, we do have these abilities. We have the ability to understand numerosity, but as a, as a fuzzy concept. Uh, and we have the ability, so the ability to understand sets, but in a fuzzy way. And we have the ability to sort of see individuals, right? One, two, and three. And maybe very, very small, um, sort of small number um, exact calculation. Um, however, if you think of it, the one thing you can't do with these two, uh, so far with these two modules is there's no mechanism to represent large sets of individuals. So exact high numbers. You can't say, you know, 99, 42, 76, 3,645,729. Uh, uh, you can't say exactly a number. You can either say an exact a small number, or you can, you, can, you can have an understanding of a fuzzy large number but you never get to develop an exact representation of high numbers. So this is a limitation. And this is where, where there's the discontinuity between us and other species, according to Spelke's theory. And the idea, again, as we said um, earlier, is that it's really the compositional semantics of natural language. And as, as, um, as Liz Spelke says, um, um, language provides the medium for combining the representations delivered by core knowledge system. So the idea is that by having natural language, we can now combine representation, we can combine the representations of the two modules. And by combining them, we can, we, we can create more than what we have with the individual modules. And we'll get to that in just one second. But so overall, her idea is the natural language serves as a lingua franca, sort of serves as, a, as the language with which modules can talk to each other. And so now representations that, that could not be put together earlier, because there was no way of putting together the representations, for example, of the, of the number sense and of subitizing, you could not put them together. There was no mechanism for bringing those together. Well, thanks to language, now these two modules can, can talk to each other. Right, they're, they're, each other's representations were unintelligible and unintelligible for the two modules. So the idea in the case of, uh, of um, um, arithmetic and ma mathematical cognition, number cognition, is that if you have the number sense module, which allows you to represent large sets vaguely, and if you have subitizing, the understanding of in small sets of individuals, you can then combine the representations of the two using language in order to develop the understanding of sets of large sets of individuals. Okay. So now you can take the understanding of a large number and the understanding that you know, a group, a set can be made of individuals, you put it together and now a large set is made of a large set of individuals. And this is what allows us uniquely to develop exact high number calculation. This is what allows us and not other species to develop the number 745, right? An exact high number, which is not delivered by either module by itself, but can be created if you can put together the representations of the number sense and the subitizing module. And this, according to the theory, is what makes us different from all other species. So this is, a, is where us uh, humans become discontinuous with other species. So we start with the same make, we start with the same modules, but then language turns these modules into so much more. That is what makes us different. That is what makes us special in this sense. That's what makes us discontinuous with other species. So is there evidence uh, for this? Well, uh, one wonderful experiment, uh, again, by Liz Spelke and um, O'Kane, 
um, in 2001, what they did is they had bilinguals um, learn um, mathematical facts and, uh, and some operations. Um, and they had bilinguals, speakers of English uh, and Spanish. Some of the facts were about exact small numbers. Some of the facts were about approximate large numbers. And other of these operations and facts were about exact large numbers. So if you think of it, the first one is about exact small numbers, so the subitizing module. The second one, approximate numerosity, is about the number sense. And the third one, exact high numbers, is about language bringing together the representations of the other two modules. So here's what they did. These bilingual speakers learned uh, these three categories of facts, but they trained them only in one of their two languages. You know, some facts they trained them in English, some facts they trained them in Spanish. And then they were tested in both languages, these facts. So here's my question to you. Uh, let's say that um, we, train, uh, we train these participants to, we train them on exact small number facts. Should it matter if we train them in English or in Spanish? I mean, think of it, the exact small number operations, in fact, this should rely on our subitizing module. So language should play no role in our understanding of uh, such facts and such uh, operations. And indeed, what, what happens is that participants are equally fast at responding um, to these facts, whether they learn them, whether they are responding in the language that they trained the fact in, the black bar, or whether they're responding in the language that they were not trained in, the gray bar. And not only they were equally quick in answering, they also were equally accurate in responding. So they, 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 they responded accurately most of the times, regardless of whether they were being tested in the language that they used to study, or if they were being tested in the other language. Okay, so how about the approximate large numbers, large number facts and operations? Well, same thing, right? Language should, shouldn't really affect um, your ability to understand um, uh, and, and to think about uh, approximate large numerosities because you have a module for that, right? You have the analog rep uh, representation module, you have the number sense. And indeed, again, um, overall, um, participants were just as fast, uh, or at least there, there's a numerical difference, but it's not statistically significant. So they were equally fast in responding, regardless of whether they were responding in the language that they were trained in or in the other language. And they were equally accurate. So again, language didn't, whether you were trained in and, and then tested in the same language or, or tested in a different language, doesn't seem to make a difference. Here's the interesting one. What's your prediction? Now we're going to look at exact large numbers. The theory says that you only get to have exact large numbers thanks to language, right? Language allows you to combine the representations delivered by the subitizing and the number sense modules. And so here it makes sense that we should expect that language should play a role in your ability to, in how you respond um, to, to, these, um, uh, to these questions. Turns out, participants are indeed systematically, significant, statistically significantly faster if they respond in the same language in which they were trained compared to if they respond to a fact in the other language in which they did not train that particular fact or operation. Similarly, they were more accurate when they were responding in the language they, they trained versus the language that they, they did not train. So this really shows that the modules and the representations of the individual modules, those don't have much to do with language. And we knew that, right? We saw the, the experiments earlier, whereby pre-linguistic infants and other species uh, can deal with these concepts. However, once we get to exact large numbers, well, you only have those if you have language. 
And indeed, we see here that language, in this case, whether you're trained in a fact or not, or sorry, whether you're, you train the fact in, a, in the language that you're tested, or if, or if you're tested in a language other than the language you trained a certain fact or operation on, it makes a difference. And it makes complete sense because language is key to exact large number representations. However, I have to say that I think there are in the literature some important counterexamples to this point of view, which I think are worth keeping in mind. Um, first, uh, Brannon and Terrace in 1998 have shown that rhesus monkeys actually are capable of exact high number representations. So in their experiment, they actually uh, demonstrated that rhesus uh, monkeys can actually precisely understand uh, the numerosity of numbers five through nine. So definitely numbers that should fall outside the, um, the reach of the subitizing module. And just because of how they did the experiment, it's very unlikely that the monkeys were using um, the number sense in order to solve uh, this problem. So it looks like they did have an understanding of exact representation of high number, which of course, by this theory, because they do not have language, they should be enabled to do. Second, Rosemary Varley, a wonderful scientist at University College London, uh, published in 2005, uh, I think a landmark paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, showing that some patients who have a specific type of aphasia known as agrammatic aphasia, lose the ability to understand grammar and syntax in natural language. So for example, if you tell them the lion killed the man, and then you show two pictures, one with a man killing a lion and one with a lion killing a man, they can't, they can't tell you um, which of the two is the one that matches the sentence. So they lost the ability um, to understand the grammar and the syntax of language. They lost, for example, the structure dependence, the ability to understand structure dependence in language, but they retain this type of ability in other domains of thought, for example, in algebra. So in their case, if you show them 10 minus five or five minus 10, and then you ask them, is this a positive number or a negative number? Now that they can do it. So they seem to have retained the understanding of structure dependence among other um, aspects, uh, among other things in algebra, but not in language. Again, indicating that it, can, it, it cannot be that we've developed algebra because we had language. And finally, I think there are a number of developmental disorders that again show that language and uh, the understanding of number uh, can dissociate. Uh, in autism, for example, typically children with autism tend to have poor language, uh, poor language skills, but they do have very good um, mathematical skills. Uh, there's a condition known as developmental dyscalculia. Now, um, children who have this condition tend to have perfectly intact and perfectly preserved language. In fact, perfectly preserved general cognition, um, but they do tend to have problems with arithmetic. So again, showing that on the one hand, you can lose language, but not lose arithmetic, or you can lose arithmetic, but not lose language. And finally, I gave you last week, the example of Williams syndrome, where, you know, they have excellent language skills, but very impaired mathematical cognition. So overall, I think these, the, these, these points of evidence definitely show that it cannot be the case that our mind has developed things such as the syntax of mathematics because we had the combinatorics of language. So it's not that we developed all these other skills because we had language that provided for us a, a framework for combining representations. Because we seem to be able to lose one without the other and vice versa. The two in the human brain seem to dissociate. So overall, I would say that perhaps the jury is still out on this issue, but these bits of evidence definitely seem to indicate that it's not the case that language is the foundation upon which we could develop uh, for which the human mind could develop all these other 
higher level aspects uh, of cognition, such as, for example, mathematics and algebra.